Thank you, Fred. That was very kind. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, before I uh, start my talk, I just want to um, recognize the uh, John Templeton uh, Foundation, uh, which is the organization responsible for the funding of this work. So as uh, Fred mentioned er, uh, just recently, um, my name is Evan Groves. I'm a postdoc here at Michigan. And over the last couple years, um, with Professor Adams, um, we've been working on um, multiverse uh, calculations and looking at anthropic arguments. So before I get into some of what these calculations are, let me give you some motivation um, for, what, for why we're doing this. So first off, if you have the question, what is the multiverse? Um, we're basically just going to treat this as a collection or ensemble of universes where the um, constants of nature and the physics itself could be different. So if this multiverse um, does exist, um, we want to know, well, what does it look like? Okay, um, is there anything special in our universe or are there any general features um, of different universes? In addition, we're going to study uh, the multiverse because we're going to look at these anthropic arguments. And so basically an anthropic argument um, basically just says that if uh, the laws of physics are the way they are because we're here to observe those laws of physics. So we want to see um, how robust these arguments are and if indeed our universe is fine-tuned um, for life. And finally, last reason we, we do this is we want to see how far um, we can push laws of physics before they break. And this just gives us more um, knowledge about what the laws of physics are in the first place. So you, there's many things you can do um, within this multiverse framework. Um, we are going to spend uh, the rest of this talk talking about uh, the way nuclear astrophysics comes into this. And so there's two, in our universe, there's two things that are important about um, nuclear astrophysics. First um, is nucleosynthesis. And so this is specifically uh, the fusion of uh, let the light nuclei into heavier um, nuclei. This is responsible for the chemical evolution um, in the universe and our galaxy in particular. A couple of different sites. We're going to focus on these first two, the early universe and stellar cores. Um, other sites, compact objects, white dwarfs, core collapse, supernova, and neutron star mergers, uh, cosmic ray spallation, and another one. In addition to nucleosynthesis, um, stars radiate energy. Um, they also uh, can produce elements which are uh, radioactive, and this can heat um, planets. Uh, we'll just focus on uh, the radiation of the energy for this talk. So to begin um, nuclear astrophysics, we need to speak a little bit about nuclear physics. And if you take anything away from this slide, or actually from this talk in general, it's that nuclear physics is hard, okay? <laughs> So we don't have a single underlying theory of nuclear structure. It's a very strongly interacting system. And basically, we have to come up with multiple models for the specific application at hand. Um, the physical characteristics, uh, the size of a nucleus is pretty small, about 10 to the minus 15 um, meters. Mass is also small. Um, 10 to the minus 24 grams, but when you look at these two and you calculate a density, um, you get a very large density here. So nuclear matter, 10 to the 14 grams per cubic centimeter. I think most people know uh, water is one gram per cubic centimeter, so this isn't something that you um, see in a normal um, uh, environment. environment. Um, a nucleus is composed of neutrons and protons. The protons are given by the atomic number. This tells you the chemistry. Um, of that element, and the, um, the sum of the neutrons and the protons is the mass number, which tells you the nuclear properties of that element. If you take the constituent nucleons of a nucleus, so let's say you have six protons and six neutrons here in carbon-12, you weigh those separately, you get a different answer for when you put them together and weigh the nucleus as a whole, right? This difference an energy is called the binding energy, and we characterize it using an MeV unit. For comparison, an MeV is a mega electron volt, one million electron volts. For comparison, when you are burning gas in your car or eating food, um, the chemical reactions are about one electron volt. So you burn you know, a, a molecule of octane, you get an electron volt, you burn a, 
a proton, you get a, a million times that. Um, as some examples of binding energies, deuterium. This is the simplest nucleus, a hydrogen, I'm sorry, it's a hydrogen isotope, of one proton, one neutron. It's, an, it's a binding energy of an MeV per nucleon. Helium-4, two protons, two neutrons, uh, seven MeV per nucleon, and the most tightly bound nucleus, iron, eight MeV per nucleon. <laughs> So once we have our little nuclei, they can interact um, with one another. So this is just supposed to be a uh, chemical, um, well, it's a nuclear, but it, it's, it's kind of drawn like a chemical reaction. You have a projectile um, on a target, and that produces these products. But it, the reaction can go one way. It can also go backwards. Um, and this is going to be important when we um, actually calculate reaction networks. I'll sometimes use this notation. Um, just as a shorthand for this uh, longer expression. The uh, cross-section of this reaction is also the probability. It gives you an effective area, um, what the target particle sees um, of the projectile, or, or what the projectile sees of the target. Uh, basically, all you need to know is that if you have a small cross-section, you have a small rate. A larger cross-section, larger rate. Um, in astrophysics, this is... For astrophysics, we have to average um, these cross-sections because we have lots of different energy scales. So as an example of a kind of uh, some reactions, uh, some nuclei aren't, aren't stable, and so they can decay by um, alpha, beta, gamma emission. Uh, we'll focus here, since we're interested in nucleosynthesis, on fusion, right? the two, nuclei, two or more nuclei coming together to form something larger. So now that we have an idea of um, what nuclear uh, physics is, let's talk about where this happens in... Um, the history of the universe. So our um, idea right now of the Big Bang is that the universe begins from a singularity. This is called the hot Big Bang model. It's very near homogeneous isotropic space-time geometry. So this is, means that it's the same in every location and it looks the same in every direction. It's close, not, per, not exactly, it's close to thermal and chemical equilibrium. So after the Big Bang, the universe expands and cools until the present day. This cartoon, this Liberty Bell um, on its side, um, you've probably seen this in other, other talks, but this, uh, I've just highlighted uh, two e epochs that are important uh, for our uh, talk. Basically, this is Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and then this is just the modern universe today where stars are in operation. So I do need to give you a little bit of an overview of BBN. So it, during BBN, we have a relativistic plasma. So these are very low mass particles in, in the plasma. It's photons, electrons, positrons, which are the antiparticle complement of electrons, and neutrinos. The non-relativistic um, are the baryons. These are just neutrons and protons. And then the dark matter, which won't, will not be important in this talk. To do a BBN calculation in the multiverse, you have to do, give it a few inputs. First, you have to give it your cosmological inputs. Okay, these are the number of baryons, neutrons plus protons, which we'll need for our nuclear reaction rates, and also the gravitational constant, which sets the Hubble expansion rate of the universe. Um, for your particle physics inputs, you need the mass of the electron, and you need to know the lifetime of the neutron. The neutron decays in our universe with a lifetime of 880 seconds. For your nuclear physics input, you need the binding energies, which we went over, and then you need the reaction cross-sections, which connect the light nuclei. So BBN is actually multiple sub-epochs, and I won't go into a lot of details on here. These are basically just supposed to show you know, neutrinos interacting with neutrinos during weak decoupling, um, neutrinos interacting with neutrons and protons, uh, weak freeze-outs. Uh, lepton annihilation is when the electrons and the positrons annihilate to produce two photons, and they essentially go away except for the ionization electrons for charge neutrality. And then this last sub epoch is actually you know, the synthesis of the light elements. And so this occurs over about 100 seconds, which is about 100 Hubble times. So this is actually a pretty slow uh, process. <clears throat> so we've mentioned earlier the number of baryons is an important input into BBN. Another way to say this is actually the entropy. And so probably a lot of you think about the entropy, you think of the disorder. And so this is basically saying, uh, this quantity here, the plasma entropy per baryon, disorder um, in the photon, electron, positron Cs divided by the number of baryons. This number is 10 to the 9 
for some comparisons, I'm cheating a little bit here, but the entropy of the air molecules in this room is about order unity, you know, maybe 10 or so. In the core of a sun, 10 to 50. In the ejecta from a neutron star merger, about 100. So 10 to the 9 is quite large. And this actually has an immediate application that the baryons will stay in chemical equilibrium to long times. The weak interaction is usually not nearly strong enough in order to keep an equilibrium, but in the early universe, this is actually the case. Two other equivalent ways to express entropy, the baryon to photon ratio, which I'll use quite frequently throughout this talk, basically one over the entropy, and also the baryon density, which is just given as the baryon energy density divided by the universe's energy density at the current epoch. So this is, that's BBN um, in a nutshell. We're obviously, very, um, uh, we were trying to study the nuclear reactions um, in BB, and the first people to do this are uh, Bob Wagner, Willie Fowler, and Fred Hoyle in the late 60s. This is a seminal work uh, in the field um, for the technology that they had to do these kind of calculations. Um, over here, this cartoon on the right um, basically just shows uh, a reaction network. So you have these different, um, isotopes in your network, and these black lines right, can, um, between the boxes are, the different, are supposed to denote the different reactions which connect um, the isotopes. If you ignore the weak interactions, which are these diagonal um, lines from top left to bottom right, um, the number of neutrons and the number of protons are separately conserved in, these in um, these, this network of interactions. And as you can see down here at the bottom, if we start with BBN only protons and neutrons, we see we only have one way to go in order to start getting up to, once we get here to deuterium, right, we have a couple of different pathways, but we have to go through this. This is called the deuterium bottleneck, all right, and it's going to be important in, in some of the multiverse um, calculations that we do later. Now, I, normally I would just skip over this right now, since it's not an important thing in general. But I actually have to point this out because it's important to this talk. This here looks like beryllium-8. That's a typo. It should be beryllium-9. Beryllium-8 should be this box right here, which doesn't exist because beryllium-8 isn't stable in our universe. We'll talk about that later um, when we talk about the triple alpha reaction. <clears throat> so this is not multiverse. This is actually um, work that I do. Uh, in our universe, um, we're calculating what the abundances are. You can see here that um, this uh, horizontal axis is the baryon content of the universe, and these vertical axes are just the different abundances for helium, isotopes, deuterium, and lithium. So these uh, solid lines that you see um, on, the, on the plot are the theoretical calculations, and then these hashed uh, boxes are the observations uh, that our astronomers tell us um, what, what they observe. So helium, the helium isotopes look like they have pretty good agreement um, with the observation and the theoretical prediction, but those error bars are actually fairly large. Let's look at deuterium. Now, in de for deuterium, um, this is observed uh, in quasar absorption systems in um, the later universe, and uh, the astronomers determine what the deuterium abundance is, all right, and then they run their BBN code to determine um, where that overlaps, and from there they say what they infer what the baryon number is. Now independently of that, the cosmologists, they took a, take a look at how sound waves propagate in the early universe, and from there they can directly obtain the baryon number. This orange stripe that you see is actually the cosmological um, observation from the Planck satellite. And lo and behold, they, all three of these things fall right on top of one another. And this is a triumph of the hot Big Bang model, this accurate prediction of this number. But alas, lithium is not correctly predicted. And this is called the lithium problem, and it's an open area of research in nuclear astrophysics. So um, now that we have an idea of what, what the interact of what the abundances are. Let's talk about the role of the weak interaction in BBN. So the weak interaction converts neutrons into protons and vice versa. So these six reactions right here. And from this, 
we can um, determine the neutron to proton ratio. And this is the number of neutrons to the number of protons, and that's important for nucleosynthesis. <clears throat> we normalize the um, strength of the weak force by using the neutron lifetime, which is this forward reaction here, a free neutron decaying into a proton, electron, and an antineutrino. <clears throat> um, because the neutron is heavier than the proton, the neutron to proton ratio is less than one. And in our universe, it's one proton, I'm sorry, it's one neutron to every seven protons. I, this is a, supposed to be kind of a general talk here. I don't want to get into this uh, specific equation, but this little formula here, if you just plug in this value of one seventh, you see that you have 75% hydrogen mass and 25% helium by mass. And this is important, right, because the hydrogen in your bodies, the hydrogen that you drink from water, that comes from the Big Bang. And so without it, if you don't have hydrogen, you don't have water. And so that's our first anthropic argument um, that we're going to see. So the weak interaction has a very important role, but let's see if you actually do need a weak interaction in order to have a, habitable, a potentially habitable universe. So if we turn off the weak interaction, we don't have any neutrinos anymore. They don't exist in a weakless universe. And so is it going to be the case that we're not going to have any hydrogen? We'll just have a pure helium universe. So um, this plot on the right is called a contour plot. It's a little technical, but I think I can do my best to try and explain it. What you do here is you pick your universe, you pick the baryon number in your universe, and then you pick the neutron to proton ratio in the universe. So the neutron to proton ratio would have to be set at a different epoch than BBN. If we just naturally pick the neutron to proton ratio to be one, and pick the baryon number in our universe, which is about six times 10 to the minus 10, we find that we're right in here. Okay, now these contours are showing um, contours of constant helium. And so I didn't draw it here, but the 100% contour is basically right there. And so you would think, oh, we're going to end up at 100% helium. This universe is um, inert. <laughs> but, um, this red star is supposed to denote where, this is just for orientation. Um, our universe has the weak interaction, so I'm kind of cheating here, but nonetheless, um, this is where our universe would kind of fall on this plot, so to speak. <clears throat> so um, if you can see, though, if you look over here, if the baryon number is low enough, the reactions are actually small enough, and there isn't as much helium over here as there is over, over to the right. And so it's actually possible to get a universe with hydrogen without a weak interaction. Now, in general, um, to we're also not in only interested in anthropic arguments. We're looking for general trends here. Um, this is, a, again, this formula that we had earlier, we can actually generalize it um, over for the region to the right of this, in this plot. Okay? And this is actually a much more symmetrical um, expression. So, as I think most of you can see, there's a high degree of symmetry in this plot. This is interesting for physicists when you see a, a large amount of symmetry. There's usually, that's indicating that there's something else going on here. Maybe there's something about the early universe and the light nuclides and the reactions that connect them that we don't really understand at this point. However, I want to caution against that interpretation because I'm the one who actually made this calculation and I know what went into it. And I don't have a very exhaustive network here. So, the fact that you have a lot of neutrons, all right, when you set the neutron to proton ratio one, you could just be seeing, right, a computa computational artifact. If you change your network, you might get more heavier elements. In fact, I know this is absolutely shameless because this has nothing to do with this talk, but earlier this week, LIGO announced a neutron star merger, and that and the neutron to proton ratio in the neutron star merger, all right, is about two. So it's that line there. Now, the entropy. In a, in a neutron star merger is way off to the right, okay? You know, the baryon content is much larger than it is in the early universe. But could this actually, in another universe, maybe you wouldn't have to worry about hydrogen and helium coming out of your BBN. Maybe it'd be gold and platinum. However, I want to caution against that, too. That's a fun thing to think about, but the, our process requires on, re relies on beta decays, and that's a weak interaction. So not in these universes are you going to get a a uh, universe where gold is more plentiful than water. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Um, the last thing I want to show you about BBN is um, 
not completely abandoning the weak interaction, but instead just making a weaker or a weak full um, interaction. So we made up this word weak full to denote a universe that has a stronger weak interaction or a smaller neutron lifetime. The weaker interaction, a weaker interaction is a longer neutron lifetime, and the, as the neutron lifetime goes to infinity, uh, that's your weak list universe. So in our universe, the neutron lifetime is 880 seconds thereabout. That's our universe. And you can see that if we change um, to weaker or weak lists, the amount of helium and the amount of hydrogen, they change relative to one another. But you still mainly get hydrogen and helium uh, in these universes. So moving on now, um, I'd like to go past BBN and go into another epoch. So after BBN, finishes, you go through photon decoupling, and then you go through the advent of large-scale structure. So <clears throat> I said earlier, everything we've talked about thus far assumes homogeneity and isotropy. But look around you. That's obviously not true. Thank goodness it is. It, it is. So if once you get into a part of the, e of the universe where matter starts to dominate, you get clumping. Okay, and that clumping occurs into large balls of gas. Those large balls of gas will, will fragment into uh, galaxy clusters. Within a galaxy cluster, you'll get individual galaxies, and then within a galaxy, you'll get stellar systems, stars, planets, etc. So we characterize that initial fluctu fluctuation in the density using this value Q, okay, which is about one part in 100,000. So the universe we're saying is very flat and smooth, except to about one part in 100,000. All right, With, if you have a cosmological constant, then you have something called vacuum energy, or which we've probably heard more uh, frequently in popular press, the dark energy. This is a purely gravitational thing, and what we, in order to characterize it, we use something called the Planck mass. Now, the Planck mass is a massive energy scale, right? 10 billion billion proton masses. For comparison, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN is only 10,000 proton masses. So this is a very high energy scale. But it's purely gravitational, as is the, the vacuum energy density. So it's, it is natural to say, like, well, maybe these two energy scales should be related to one another. But in our universe, they are different by about 120 orders of magnitude, not even close. So this is a, a crisis. In, um, in cosmology. <laughs> now, Steven Weinberg, um, many people have been talking about this, uh, but in the late 80s, he, has a, he wrote a paper on trying to explain why this um, cosmological constant is so small. Now, I won't go in. These are very complicated theories um, that he came up with. But as a last resort, he made an anthropic argument, saying that it's got to be small because we can see it, because we're here to see it. Now, in his opinion, these first two, he did not think those were likely. He did not give an opinion on this third one. This one he thought was hopeful, quantum cosmology. This is the kind of stuff Stephen Hawking works on. And then for the anthropic principle, well, he wasn't too fond of that. But he said, like, well, this is always a fallback option if we can't get it. Now, this was done 30 years ago or so. Nothing's happened for these four theories. Um, and in fact, Fred and I took a look at this weak anthropic argument. And we said, OK, if you, have, if you want to make an anthropic argument, well, you can certainly change your vacuum energy density, but there's other things you can change here. Now, again, this, I don't mean to get into the details of this equation. Basically, um, we derive this equation from the constraint that large-scale structure has to form in the early universe. And then we changed all these different quantities uh, where the, the, the value in the parentheses are the values in our universe. We changed all these different quantities to see um, what would happen um, if, from an anthropic standpoint. <clears throat> um, if you change eta, the baryon to photon ratio, and if you change the Planck mass, you're changing gravity. And so that's going to change BBN. And so this other contour plot shows the, the contour space of all these different universes with different gravitational strengths and different baryon content. Now, as you can see, 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 6, that's 6 orders of magnitude, and then minus 2 up to 6, 8 orders of magnitude. This is a huge contour space. But these contours of hydrogen, right, this is our anthropic limit here, go from about 100% 
down to 10%. That's not much change. So basically, when you change these two things um, over a vast amount of area, you're, you're actually not getting much change at all in the amount of hydrogen. This red star, again, is our universe. So from this and from some of the other arguments we made in the paper, we, um, sorry, we put an anthropic constraint on the vacuum energy density that's still small, 10 to the minus 90, but it's 30 orders of magnitude larger than what, what's seen in our universe. So we were making the opinion that um, out of the five theories that Weinberg um, gave, uh, we don't really think any of them are all that, are all too constraining. <clears throat> so the last part of this talk, I want to talk to you about stars. Now, given everybody's proximity to a star and the fact that you can see stars, I don't need to go into as much detail, I believe, than I, I, I did Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, I just, let's just talk about what the nuclear reactions are doing within a star. So the first stage that I have here is a pr two protons coming together to form a deuterium um, atom. This is a weak, uh, deuterium nucleus. This is a weak uh, interaction. Fr with that deuterium nucleus, it can capture a proton to form helium-3. And then two helium-3 comes together, and that forms your helium-4, right, plus two more protons. Uh, together, these, two, these three reactions are called the PP reaction. And this cartoon at, over here just shows that six protons come together to form one helium nucleus and two extra protons. From here, we can um, use the helium-4 and go through something what's called the triple alpha reaction to make uh, carbon, which again, there's an anthropic uh, application here since carbon's important for um, life on Earth at least. And then after this, um, we can burn the carbon, the oxygen into neon, into the magnesium, sulfur, eventually into iron. But uh, for the purposes of this talk, uh, these four reactions are, are what we'll think about. So let's talk again about uh, deuterium. Now you would think deuterium is the smallest nucleus, right, besides single proton hydrogen. Um, and so this is a great place to start learning nuclear physics, right, as it's the smallest nucleus. But that's not at all true. Unfortunately, deuterium is not at all a typical nucleus. It's got a dumbbell kind of shape, all right? Instead of being like a little ball, it looks more like a dumbbell. There are no excited states, and it's very weakly bound. So in order to do any experiments on deuterium in a lab, you end up just blowing it apart. So it's very, so unfortunately, it's not a good nucleus to, um, to learn nuclear physics about. However, deuterium is the first step in nucleosynthesis, so we need to think about this. And so if it's so, if it's so loosely bound, what would happen in a universe that doesn't have a bound state of deuterium? Is this, again, only going to have single proton hydrogen and basically be free of any heavier elements? <clears throat> now, there is a way around this. It's a little bit of a cheat, but, but go with me here. The carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle is another way to burn hydrogen into helium. It uses carbon as a catalyst. And so you start with carbon, you add hydrogen to these different nuclei, and at the very end, you get, back, you get out a helium nucleus and your original carbon nucleus. So this is why it acts as a catalyst. So this plot um, that you see on the right-hand side is called an HR, Hertzsprung-Russell, uh, diagram. Um, I'm going to have to explain a little bit of it so that we understand what's going on. Um, this uh, Vertical axis is the luminosity, which is the power output. That's how brightly the stars are shining. The horizontal axis is your surface temperature. So it just says how hot the surface of the star is. And these points that you're seeing on these, on these curves are a whole bunch of different stars, starting at high mass up here in the top left and going down to low mass uh, here in the uh, bottom right. And so these plots are plotted for different stars um, that are on their main sequence in the CNO cycle. So these stars have just started burning uh, hydrogen into helium via the CNO cycle. Now, I have different metallicities here. This is what Z means. And these are actually very small metallicities. For comparison, the metallicity of the sun is 2%. So these are pretty small compared to this. If there's 100 billion stars in the galaxy, 
A metallicity of 10 to the minus 10 means that there's only 10 solar masses worth of metals in that galaxy. So, so it, it's pretty small, but as you can see, it can burn hydrogen into helium um, fa fairly well. So this gives evidence, right, that the CNO cycle can create, you know, does not need a stable deuteron state in order to create helium. But you may ask, well, how did you get those metals in the first place? Fair question. So Professor Adams and I thought, like, well, if we don't have a stable um, deuterium state, maybe we can jump over it. And so what we did is say, like, well, the weak interaction is still in operation in these universes. We can change a proton into a neutron uh, via this reaction, via the standard PP reaction. And then from there, we'll make a three-body reaction similar to the triple alpha reaction. And so a neutron and two protons will come together and form the helium-3 nucleus. Now, this is going to be a small cross-section, but non-zero nonetheless. And so in order to do this reaction, you have to assume that the deuteron state has a certain lifetime. 10 to the minus 16 seconds is pretty short, but on a nuclear scale, that's actually pretty good. That's, that's sizable enough that you can get a... Um, that you can get past that deuterium bottleneck. So this, the technical term for this plot is a spaghetti plot, since you have all these different lines here on this plot. You have mass fraction on your vertical axis versus the time um, since the formation of the star. And this is, this is showing the, how the abundances evolve for a 15 solar mass star. Now, if you just on first glance, um, this, this plot doesn't look uh, very unusual. Okay, you start with hydrogen, you burn that into helium, you burn that into carbon, you burn that into oxygen. Okay, that's very typical of a star. But if you actually look at this a little bit more closely, what you can see here is you have a sea of free neutrons in a star, which is not at all typical of any star in this universe. But this is a way to get past uh, the deuterium bottleneck. Now, going back to the BBN epoch, if you have an unstable deuterium state, what is going to happen in BBN? Will that um, screw anything up? Not at all. So in BBN, if you have only the triple nucleon and, and no stable deuterium state, you are going to, this again is another spaghetti plot, it, you can ignore the, um, this uh, horizontal axe um, label. Basically, just it, all that's important is that time moves from left to right, from a hot universe into a, into a cooler universe. And so um, this blue line here at the very top of the plot, that's basically just saying that you start off with 50% neutrons, 50% hydrogen, and you end with 100% hydrogen. And to, it's good to one part in 10 to the 14, basically. So this is not at all anthropically limited. Now, this is different, obviously, than what's going on in a star for multiple reasons, but for primarily because of the entropy of the early universe is so high. Now, we were talking about weakless universes in BBN. Let's talk about weakless stars. Here there is no PP reaction because that is a fundamentally a weak interaction. Now on the face of it, it wouldn't appear that that's a problem because weak, uh, weakless universes during BBN will produce helium and helium burns in stars. But it doesn't burn for very long. And in order to have life develop, we the basic assumption is that you need, you know, a long time, you know, billions of years um, on a planet. So <clears throat> um, we do have um, a lot of deuterium, though, uh, in this uh, in this universe, and so maybe we there's another way we can actually burn the deuterium, and it lasts a long time, right? So uh, this is a kind of an interesting uh, topic, just on its own merit, because this looks actually like BBN in a star. And of course, I know I sound like a broken record here, but the entropy is different. The early universe has a very high en en entropy. So this plot is courtesy of Alex Howe. And what he did here, he's a collaborator um, of Professor Adams and I. Uh, he looked at how the sun evolves, um, which is this black curve here in our universe. Okay, these different plots are the surface temperature, the luminosity, and the radius plotted as a function of stellar age. And then he came up with this weakless analog, a weakless sun. So the weakless sun it has a different mass uh, um, of, than compared to, to our sun, right? So about a 20th 
um, the mass. It starts with a much larger fraction of deuterium uh, compared to uh, our sun, but it still is able to produce a long time of constant luminosity, which is important from a habitability perspective. So this is, this is a log, logarithmic axis. So this is billions of years over here, just like our sun is also able to do. So in this case, a weakless universe can still produce long-lived stars, which is, which is the, habit of the anthropic argument. <clears throat> now, this is, was un, unbeknownst to me um, when I first started doing this. But in our universe, um, we have deuterium. And so it's good to only to one part in 10 to the 5. Uh, so most of water right, is going to just be single proton hydrogen. But there does exist deuterated. Uh, water. If this is concentrated, if the deuterium is concentrated in the water to about 50%, that's toxic uh, to biological organisms. Now, it's not exactly known why this is. Um, what it's thought is that there's an increased strength um, between in hydrogen bonds, so de the deuterium compared to the single proton. This affects how proteins fold, and then this interferes with cell division and causes cancer. In a weakless universe, most water will actually be deuterated. Um, but we don't see this as a problem because things had to evolve on this planet for a single uh, energy in the hydrogen bonds. And so on a, in a weakless universe, they would just evolve differently. And in fact, in that case, uh, single proton water could actually be the, the toxic quantity. <clears throat> so now, before I conclude, it's time to come to the grand finale. If you're going to do nuclear astrophysics, you have to do the triple alpha reaction. There's no other, you have no other option. So again, um, the triple alpha reaction, right, are these three um, helium nuclei uh, that come together to form a carbon-12 nucleus. Uh, helium nuclei are also called alpha particles. That's why it's called the triple alpha. Now, in the early 50s, Fred Hoyle, who is this gentleman second from the left sitting, um, he had a model for red giant stars in our universe. And when he, he was a very adept astronomer. And so when he looked at these stars, he, set, he realized that in his model, they were much too cool to be able to burn, carbon be able to burn helium into carbon-12 in the cores of their stars. So he predicted that there had to be a resonance in this reaction here. And in, um, he told this to Willie Fowler, who was a professor at Caltech, and Willie didn't believe him, didn't think that, that, was, that was possible. But then a uh, young postdoc uh, in the early 50s named Wald Whaling went and measured this and said, dear goodness, it, it is there. It is a huge resonance, and it's exactly like Fred Hoyle predicted. And so this is the, the if not the first, one of the first predictions that nuclear astrophysics gave was the um, indication of that resonance, you know, in order to increase the uh, triple alpha rate. So after this, many people um, said, well, if carbon is, carbon certainly exists in this universe, all right, it's not made in BBN, and it's, um, the principal mechanism is the resonant triple alpha re reaction. So if that, react if that resonance were not there, that reaction would be way too slow, there would be no carbon, there would be no life. So this is the anthropic argument made, and it was made by many people, including um, Fred Hoyle himself. Uh, in the late 80s, um, Mario Livio did calculations where he changed the resonance, doing in the multiverse, he changed the resonance by only a few percent, and showed that stars can still make um, carbon-12 uh, through the triple alpha reaction with a slightly different uh, resonance. Now, Beryllium-8 in our universe is, un, uh, is unstable, but it's barely unstable. Changing the binding energy of beryllium-8 by, by a little bit more than a tenth of a percent will actually make it stable. So if you change the resonance in carbon-12 by a few percent, changing the um, binding energy of, of beryllium-8 is actually a smaller relative change. So we asked the question, well, what if beryllium-8 is stable? And what we did is we used the MESA um, stellar code and added in two new reactions, right? So this is the double alpha 
reaction to a stable beryllium-8, which can later capture another alpha particle and produce carbon-12. So this does not at all rely on the triple alpha reaction in the resonant, in the Hoyle resonance. So we took the triple alpha reaction, we took it apart, this is, since it's basically a, a conglomeration of multiple things, <clears throat> and we use those um, different cross sections um, in, this, in these two reactions. And we had to change the strengths of those cross sections compared to our universe. This HR diagram that you see on the right is a, um, shows the helium burning main sequence. Um, the colored lines are for different cross sections. Um, the larger the C value, the larger the cross section. This is helium, helium burning to beryllium. Uh, for comparison, this solid uh, black line is the triple alpha uh, reaction in our universe. So as you can see, you're able to burn beryllium uh, I'm sorry, you're able to burn helium into beryllium in a universe that doesn't have the triple alpha reaction. <clears throat> but we also, obviously, beryllium isn't the goal here, it's carbon. And so this spaghetti plot um, shows both, you know, turning on that double alpha reaction and then the carbon production reaction. And what you can see, right, is that you end up burning hydrogen and helium at the same time. And at the very end here, this magenta curve is the production of carbon-12. So here is an example of, an, of a universe, this is for a 15 solar mass star, of a universe where you're able to produce carbon without the triple alpha reaction. But there is a significant ca caveat on here. We had to change the cross-sections of um, helium of the double alpha reaction and the helium to alpha to the alpha to plus beryllium 8 reaction into carbon 12. We had to change this much different than our universe in order to get this. So th this parameter space, so to speak, is kind of far away from our universe. Nonetheless, it was an interesting result. <clears throat> so to, conc to conclude, um, I probably, I, I'm probably pretty biased and I've, I think I've answered these, I don't want to answer these questions for you, I want you guys all to think about these questions about what we've talked about today. Um, I think I probably have already given my opinion away that I don't really find the anthropic argument all that constraining, but perhaps um, other people do. Um, Fred, I, I am leaving in a few weeks uh, to go to Los Alamos, but Fred and I still have an ongoing uh, collaboration. Um, we're, we're continuing our work with um, Alex Howe, who's a postdoc, uh, here in astronomy um, on looking at the weak interaction in, um, in BBN and in stars. Um, we're also looking more at this carbon-12 resonance and changing that around and also looking to see um, if resonances in ox oxygen-16 can be changed. This is work that's done with Lillian Wong, who's an undergraduate uh, here at Michigan. And then in addition, um, as I said, beryllium-8 isn't stable. There are no stable um, isotopes at mass number eight or at mass number five. And so if that were not the case in a different universe, um, can BBN actually make um, larger nuclei if it doesn't have to get, jump over these gaps? And will stars burn um, faster uh, in those other universes? And this is work that's being done with George Fuller, uh, who is my advisor uh, at San Diego on this. So thank you all um, for your time. I think we're going to have questions afterwards, so I guess we'll talk then. Thanks again. <laughs>